ago, we started a series um, that we just entitled Essentials. Essentials and just looking in to the things that are really important right now. What really matters? What should hold our attention? What should have our focus? What things should we be focusing on and doing and putting into practice in our life? And to give you just a quick recap, we started off week one talking about the importance of our faith. Our faith in Jesus, our faith in his word, and simply just living a life of faith. I don't think anybody realized how essential living a life of faith would be in 2020 until you live 2020. Come on, somebody, that's the truth. Then we looked at the importance of our peace, how it's essential to have peace that Jesus has given, that you can have peace even in the middle of a storm. Then we kind of looked at the significance of God's word, that God has a word for any of your many things, that even though there may be a lot of things that are changing and shifting in our world, his word remains the same. Absolutely the truth. Last week, we looked at the power of our praise and really just called it praise potential, that we will bless the Lord or should be blessing the Lord at all times, in every season of our life, we have a reason to praise God. Amen. And so today I want to jump into another subject, another thing that I think is essential, I believe is essential and important for us right now. And we see this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, a very short, very brief, but very powerful and important verse of Scripture. And it just simply says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. A few other places in the epistles, it kind of reads a little bit differently, but just capturing the significance and importance of prayer. In Ephesians 6 and verse 18, it just simply says to pray always. In Philippians 4 and verse 6, it says, in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. And then in Colossians 4 and verse 2, it says, continue earnestly in prayer. So we can see here, the importance of our prayer. It's not one of those things you can just kind of skip over. One of those things you can go, yeah, that, that's a nice thing I should be doing. It's really something that is essential to our life as believers, as Christians, and as the people of God. We should be a people of prayer. And I know when you even say the word prayer, people probably have a lot of things that come to mind. You know, you probably think of people that you've heard pray, that prayed good prayers. You know what I mean? People that you thought, well, that person really knows how to pray. You may think of something as simple as praying over your food, you know. Um, but prayer is important. And if I could just kind of like uh, define it in a very simple way, and this definitely didn't capture everything about prayer, um, I'll, I would define it this way. Prayer is essentially fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. And certainly there's a lot of different directions, different kinds, different ways you can pray, but prayer is essentially talking to God and Him talking to you. There's fellowship, there's communion there. And so I can remember as a kid, I heard my mom pray, my dad pray, my grandparents pray, you know, and I, I was taught to pray. There's a lot of good prayers that we could pray, should be praying uh, in Scripture. And even growing up in this church as a part of our youth ministry, we had like a discipleship group, and there'd be times when we got together and we got in a prayer circle. Anybody know anything about a prayer circle? We got in a prayer circle, and you held hands, and everyone went around, and they prayed their prayer. And I'm telling you what, nothing more nerve-wracking for a teenager Come on, I was pitting out, my hands were sweaty, I was so nervous, my stomach, I got butterflies in my stomach because I was waiting for my time to pray and there was nothing worse than if it was almost your turn to pray, pray and the person right next to you prayed every word you were about to pray. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, they prayed it, they prayed the scripture, they prayed every everything that you're about to pray. Like, oh God, what am I going to say? You know what you do when that happens? When they squeeze your hand, you just do the quick bypass. You squeeze the hand of the person right next to you and you're like, oh, hey, and and it's your turn in the name of Jesus. And I think so many times we get a little bit nervous about, about praying, about praying. And we kind of miss the heart or the point of prayer. You know, I'm, a, I'm a pastor, um, and so because I'm a pastor, I end up praying in front of people a lot. I've already done it a couple of times today, and I'm not through, all right? That means I, I pray in front of, of other people, and I've prayed at funerals. I've prayed at weddings. Um, 
I've prayed at graduations. Um, I've prayed at the National Day of Prayer in our community. And it's funny how when you're about to pray in those situations, when you're about to pray, you're thinking about everything except praying to God. Let me put it to you this way. You're thinking about what everyone else is going to think about what you're going to say. Anybody know what I mean by that? Even in our family, when we first, uh, Aaron Cody and I first got married, um, and I joined her family, the Myers clan, and the, you know, and, and anyway, and I can remember joining their family, and the first Thanksgiving that I had being a part of her family, her grandma was so excited that she had a minister in the family. She had a minister in the family that before we had Thanksgiving together, she said, we have a minister in our family now, and I would like for Aaron to pray over Thanksgiving dinner. I'll tell you what, I got nervous right then. I mean, I'm nervous. I mean, it's just because it just feels like what are people going to think and what are people going to say. And the Lord just really corrected me and instructed me one time, particularly right before a national day of prayer. I'm sitting there, and it's almost time, almost my time to pray, and there's some good prayers in the room. I've never, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, Pastor Joshua Joy Dara right here in our community. If you've ever heard him pray, it's like he prays heaven down back and forth like three or four times when he's praying. So I'm like, man, I'm about to pray right before or after him, getting a little bit nervous. And the Lord just corrected me and instructed me and actually said to me like this, Aaron, who are you talking to when you pray? Who are you talking to when you pray? And it really kind of made me think, well, I mean, obviously there's going to be a lot of people that are going to hear me when I pray, but when I pray, I'm talking to you. And the Lord just said, pray like you're talking to me. Forget the crowd. Forget the people. Forget the people that are in the room. Realize that when you pray, it is fellowship to God, fellowship with God. And the Lord just said, pray to me like you've prayed before. But it took a load off right there. And I just got and prayed and prayed like I had talked to God before. Now, in G- Jesus, when he was talking about the significance of prayer, he said it like this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. He said, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Now, some time ago when I was reading this passage of Scripture, the Lord just highlighted something to me probably that you saw here when we were just reading it. But three times it says, when you pray. Of course, Jesus is leading up to what we know as the Lord's Prayer. But notice what is he saying, something just basic, something essential, something that he is assuming that disciples of his should do, believers should do. What? They should pray. It's not an if you pray. It is a when you pray. When you pray, when you shut your door, when you pray to the Father, when you talk to him, it's not something that is an if, it is something that is a when. It's one of those things that you should be doing. Now, I know in this time and in this season, you know, we're kind of stepping into summertime. I don't know if anybody have any, have any plans to go on vacation. Anybody got any plans to go anywhere this summer, all right? I heard somebody post something on, online. They said, for all the people in Texas and for all the people in Florida, you're not invited to Mardi Gras. And for us, we got plans. We got some things that we're going to do. And I was packing a bag even last night. And I was thinking about all the things that I'm packing in my bag. And you realize that there are some things that you pack that are essential and some things that you pack that are not essential, that you just want, right? There's some things that really matter, and there's some things that maybe don't matter as much. Anybody ever packed a bag? Anybody ever packed a suitcase? There's some things that really matter, and there's some things that don't matter as much. Let me just give you a couple of illustrations, all right? And you can let me know what you think is important. How about uh, toothbrush or hairbrush? Anybody that said hairbrush, the person next to you just moved another seat away. They moved from six feet to eight feet, right? This may get a little bit personal. Underwear or hat? If you said hat, that same person just moved another seat away. Deodorant or cologne? Come on, there's a fix-all for that. You just buy some Axe and you just spray it all over the place. 
I learned this lesson a hard way when I was in high school. My freshman year, before I went to school one day, I forgot to put on my deodorant that whole day. I tell you what, I raised my hand one time to ask the teacher a question, and after I smelled myself, the rest of the day is like this. It's like, hey. All right. Bible or iPhone? That's a tough one. Some of y'all like, Pastor, you can just take your iPhone and you can do both. All I'm saying is there are some things that are more important than, than other things. And prayer is one of those things that you put in the bag. Prayer is one of those things that's not an if. It's one of those things that it's a, it's a win, right? So Jesus, I like one of the things that he, light, he highlights in the when you pray, leading up to the Lord's Prayer, is he says when you pray, he says you go into your closet and you pray to the Father. You pray to the Father. And even the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, the first thing that we see is this. He says, our Father who's in heaven. What is he saying here? He's like, you can talk to God like he is your Father. You can have fellowship and communion with God like he is your Father. And this is really a paradigm shift in that time because God is really seen at that time someone big, someone sovereign, the creator, the judge. He's righteous. He's holy. And Jesus is saying you can pray to our Father who is in heaven. You can have genuine, authentic communion and fellowship with the God who is, yes, the creator of everything, who is, yes, awesome and mighty, who is, yes, he is in heaven and he's sovereign, but Yes, he is your father. You can have fellowship and communion with him. You can talk to him. I think it's funny sometimes when people pray and they shift the way that they talk when they start praying. You know what I mean? God understands your Cajun English, and you can talk to him in Cajun English. Come on, anybody in the room, right? I think it's funny how sometimes people when they pray, I mean, before they pray, they're talking just like I'm talking. Then when they start praying, they're like, oh, dear God. Our heavenly Father, and it's like, who are you? What country did you come from? Did you, did you, you know, did you fly over, you know, from the like? What, what is happening? Why are you talking like that? They go straight from talking how they normally talk straight to King James, you know. God heard you before. He heard you in the middle, and he'll hear you after. You can talk to him. He just likes the communion. He likes the fellowship. Prayer is not hard. Prayer is essential. I've said this for years, but when our kids were little, Avery, Macy, and Jude, when they first uh, got old enough where they could kind of start talking and communicating, even if they said words wrong, I didn't care. Even if I couldn't understand the words that they were trying to communicate, even if it didn't come out just right, if, even if it was just all jumbled together, I was just glad that they were trying to talk to me. I didn't give my kids not one spanking, not one discipline, not one correction because they were trying to communicate with me. I was just glad it was happening, right? In fact, I'm like, come on, do it some more. Say some more. I just like that you're trying to talk to me right now. And I think sometimes people don't step into a life of prayer because they don't feel like they're good enough. They don't feel like they know their words to say. They can't speak the King James English. They don't sound like the Pope or they don't sound like the bishop. They don't sound like the pastor. They don't sound like the grandma or whoever they really think is a great prayer. And they don't step into a life of prayer. And I want you to know this. God just longs for communion and fellowship with you. He longed for it so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. He sent his son Jesus to shed his blood, to make a new and a living way for you to have real conversation with with God, and you can talk to him in church, you can talk to him at the house, you can talk to him at work, and you can talk to him while you're mowing the yard, you can talk to him when you're at the gym, and you can talk to him when you're taking a walk. God just wants you to have that communion and that fellowship and that closeness with him. If I'm honest with you, there's been times when I prayed, when after I prayed, I thought about what I prayed, and I thought, that didn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't even know if that's theologically correct, <laughs> but I'm just... I'm, I'm taking a step. I'm just talking to God. I'm fellowshipping with God, with, with my Father. Amen. I love one of the things I heard about uh, Kenneth E. Hagin. He would tell this story about how he prayed and how one minister had overheard him praying and then told other ministers this. He said, Brother Hagin doesn't know the first thing about prayer. He just sits there. And just has a conversation with God. I thought that's kind of funny. Brother Hagin said, he's exactly right. He said, I'd just sit there and I'd have a talk with God. 
Conversation with God. Communion with God. Fellowship with the one who created me. A few weeks ago, we looked into Luke chapter 10 and how Jesus visited two sisters, Mary and Martha. Specifically, he went to Martha's house. And at Martha's house, of course, they're at the feet of Jesus. They're hearing his words, but Martha gets up and she starts serving. She starts doing what she feels is best to make Jesus comfortable and to serve him well. And then she interrupts Jesus. And she says, Jesus, don't you think my sister should come help me serve right now? I mean, I'm doing this all by myself. And Jesus says this. He says, Martha, Martha, you're troubled about many things. Mary has chosen that good part, that good thing, and it shall not be taken away from her. What part had Mary chosen? She had chosen to be at the feet of Jesus and to hear the words of Jesus. Now, one of the things you have to know about Jesus is there's different times and different ways that he ministered. There's times that he ministered to the multitudes, thousands and thousands of people where he would teach and he would minister and he'd preach and he'd heal and he'd deliver, right? But there was also other times where he'd get alone and get with his disciples, get with the 12 or get with the three. And in those times, his disciples would have conversation with him, communion with him. They'd ask him questions. That makes me believe something about this moment when Jesus is at Mary and Martha's house. He's at their house, and I happen to believe that Jesus didn't just show up and give a two-hour dissertation of everything they needed to know right in that moment. I believe he's at their house, and it's not just a monologue. I believe there's a dialogue that is going on. There's conversation that's going on. There's communion that's going on. Jesus is at the house. And let me help you out with something. Listen, Jesus is at your house. There's a way that has been made. There's a door that has been opened. There is fellowship that is available. And it's not just a monologue one way or the other. It's not just you just telling God everything. There's for 30 minutes and just walking out the door. And it's not just you sitting there and God is. God wants to hear from you and you need to hear from him. It's a dialogue. It goes both ways. And certainly we yield our life to his word and his instruction and his leading and his guiding. But God even said, come now, let us reason together. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk. Let's have communion. And I believe it's in those times when you open up your heart in prayer, you open up your heart in fellowship with God, when God can bring the instruction, he can bring the correction, he can bring the insight and the wisdom that you need. He can bring to your remembrance the things that he has spoken to you. You need that fellowship with God. It is essential for your life. I would bet even in the past two months, if anyone would have said, I don't have time to pray, I would just have to tell you, that cannot be true. There's been nowhere to go, no ball games, no karate, no restaurants, nothing to do, just at the house. You have time to pray. You have time to fellowship with God. You have time to commune with him. You have time to lift up your voice to the God who created you. In Psalms, it says it like this. Psalm chapter 5 and verses 1 through 3. The psalmist says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I will pray. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look God, first thing, I give you my attention. First thing, you're going to hear my voice. First thing, I'm going to pray to you. If I'm honest with you, in my own personal prayer life, first thing in the morning, it's not like three pages of prayers that are coming out of my mouth. The first prayer that's coming out of my mouth is simply like, good morning, Lord. Help me make it over to the coffee right now. Help me right now. Simple. For so many years of my life, some of the last words that would come out of my mouth before I go to bed is just simply, good night, Lord. You know what that is? It's acknowledging God. It's simple fellowship with God. It's simple communion with God. How about you just open the door and acknowledge him? Make room for him. Talk to him. 
And listen, I believe in spending extended times in prayer. I believe in that, but how about just start the conversation first thing in the morning. Finish your day talking to God, fellowshipping with him, communing with him. Good morning, Lord. Hallelujah. I acknowledge you today. I acknowledge you today. Yeah, I've been reading this book, and it's called um, Seven Men and Seven Women, and it is simply listing 14 people who did magnificent things with their life. And it's kind of like a mini biography on all of these different people. So I've read some different ones. I just finished reading one on Susanna Wesley. Anybody ever heard of Susanna Wesley? Susanna Wesley was the mother of 19 children, 19 children. Um, and a number of them passed even in infancy, and so she ended up raising 10 children, 10 children, and two of which you may be familiar with. One was a name by the name of John Wesley. Another is the name of Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley is said to have written some 6,000 hymns or songs, right? John Wesley, uh, one of the founders of, if the founder of the Methodist movement, the Methodist church, great revivalist, great prayer, great man of God. That his mother was Susanna Wesley. I don't know if you've ever uh, felt like you were too busy to pray, but I would imagine a mother of 10 children may have that thought. Come on, some of y'all are too busy, and it's just you. It's like I'm by myself all day long, and I've just got so much to do. Anybody with one child? Anybody had one child, and you thought, man, I, my life has really gotten really busy with one kid? Anybody, when you, you thought that, and then you had two, and then you're like, what was I thinking on just the one? Was that, For us, we had, we had one, we had two, and then once we hit three, we were like, dear God, what have we done? One was okay because we could take turns. Two's like, all right, you take one, I take one. When you got three, it's like, we're losing the battle, y'all. We're going down fast. Send help. Send, come on. Right? But can you imagine 10 kids? It is said of her that she had an appointment with God every evening. And some of y'all need to make an appointment with God. Make an appointment with God. She had an appointment with God every evening. And one of the things that she would do as a habit, one of the things that she would do is she would take her apron and pull it over her head. And she would begin to pray. Gives new definition to a prayer closet, doesn't it? She just made a prayer closet just right where she was at right? She just pulled that apron right up over her head, and she began to pray, and the kids knew that when mama has the apron pulled over her head, do not interrupt her. Mama is praying right now. Now, that lets me know something, that I've got no excuses, that if a mama of 10 kids could make it a priority to have an appointment with God and say, look, there may not be a room in the house where I can get away. There may not be a place I can go, but I'm about to make this place my place. Glory to God. What place can you make your place? It could be a walk around the neighborhood. It could be a place on the couch. It could be you simply saying, all right, right now, I'm taking the opportunity to take a towel, throw it over my head, and just make it a prayer closet. Praise God. Amen. And she raised some giants in the faith. One by the name of John Wesley, who was a revivalist. And one of the things that he is quoted as saying is this. It seems God is limited by our prayer life. That he can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him. When you know the context of John Wesley and how he's raised and how he'd seen a mother pray like that, you can see the significance and the weight of what he's saying. God moves when we pray. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan or a way or a will, but it does mean this. God needs your will. God needs your ask. God needs your petition. Listen, we know that God moves and God does things, and we know that he has the power and the ability to do anything, and yet he relies on our faith. Say, so, well, can anything hinder God? Well, unbelief hinders God. Doubt hinders God. Faith moves God. Ask and you shall receive. There needs to be an ask. Seek and you shall find. There needs to be a seek, right? Knock and the door shall be open. There needs to be a knock. Could it be that in this season you're limiting your joy because you're limiting your prayer life? Could it be it in this season that you're limiting your peace because you're limiting your prayer life? One of the places we read says to pray about everything, and the peace of God will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Want more peace? 
Pray more. Want more joy? Pray more. There's fellowship with God in His presence. There's fullness of joy. Hallelujah. It's found in Him. Don't limit what God can do or wants to do in your life by limiting your prayer life. In the Gospel of John chapter 15 and verse 7, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. If you abide in me. Listen, one of the things you need to know about your prayer life is that when you're abiding in God, when you're praying, when you're talking to Him, is that He's listening. He's listening. His ears are open. First Peter, that's actually what it says. It says the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. God's ears are open. Quoting from Psalm 34, which says that his ears are open unto their, to their cry. Come on. How many mamas, you, you know when it's your baby's cry? There may be a thousand babies in the room, or, but in one, when it's your baby, you know, you know when it's a serious cry, when it's a not serious cry. You know when it's a, when it's a cry because their sister slapped them. You know when it's a cry when it's something different. You know, right, you know all the different cries. Know this, that your Father God, He hears you when you pray. He's paying attention to your petition. He's listening to your voice. Your prayer gets the attention of the Father. Your prayer gets the attention of heaven. You know, one of the interesting things for me in this season, I've been, I just kind of systematically read through the, the New Testament and read a proverb every day and then just kind of work through my, my way through the Old Testament, just kind of just continuously just reading it very simply, not a, not a ton at a time, but just a little bit at a time, just kind of like to read through it. And just so happened that the past few weeks, I've ended up in the book of Revelation. There's nothing quite like reading the book of Revelation during a pandemic. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what in the world am I reading and what is going on in our world and how does this all connect together? And I'd be the first to tell you, I don't have all the answers to all the things that are happening in our world or that are, 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 are in the book of Revelation. But one of the things that I noticed that I took away specifically for today is that the prayers of the saints come up before the Father. Scripture calls it incense before him. There's a smell to your prayer. Have you ever smelled something and you, I mean, you were, it was undeniable. You knew what that was. Like, smell will get your attention, won't it? Think about your prayer going up before God and it gets his attention. So, That's the prayers of my people. That's the prayer of my kids. That's the prayers of my saints coming up before me. Your prayer is gets the Father's attention, and it comes up before Him. Hallelujah. And of all the things that you could do, of all the things that you could make time for, prayer is essential right now. It's necessary right now. So, well, well Pastor Aaron, what, what should I pray about? Can I give you a big answer? Everything. Well, who should I pray for? Well, everybody. But, but can I give you two groups of people that, that, that really need your prayer right now? And it's not your favorite groups, I'm going to tell you right now. The authorities and your enemies. <laughs> I got two amens and the rest of y'all still working on it. You're like, oh, God help us. Timothy actually says, first of all, you pray for kings. You pray for those that are in authority. That means we are commissioned by God to pray for our president all the way down to our governor and everyone in between, all the way down to our mayors and city officials, all the way down to whoever's on the Rapids Parish School Board. Right? doesn't mean you like everything about them, voted for them, would ever vote for them again. He says, you pray for them, that we may lead a godly and a peaceable life, ultimately so that the gospel can go forward. Right? So if you have your list of things and people that you pray for and you don't have the authorities on there, kings and those who are in authority, you need to put them on the list. Amen. It's easy to criticize. 
but we're encouraged and really commissioned to pray. Amen. So I want us to take a few minutes as we, we close today and to actually pray together. Amen. So I'm going to take a few minutes. I'm going to pray. I'm going to lead us in praying for our authorities, and praying for our community, praying for our leaders, praying for you. All right. Are you all ready for this? Lord, we come to you today. We thank you for your peace. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for your help. And right now, we follow your leading and your guiding and your instruction as we pray. We pray to you, Father God. We pray in the name of Jesus. We really pray through and by the blood of Jesus the way that you have made for us. And we pray with the help and the aid of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we rely on your help as we pray. And we pray according to your word, God. It gives us a foundation to pray. So as we pray, Lord, we pray for our leaders, those that are in authority. We pray for our president. We pray for our vice president, secretary of state, every senator, every congressman, all the way down through to our governor, our governor, all the leaders in our state, all the way through to our mayors, Alexandria, Pineville, and other towns and villages, God. We ask that you give them wisdom, give them courage, give them godly counsel, protect them. Angels, you're on assignment to watch over them in the name of Jesus. Send people across their path to minister and to speak unto them, to speak words that bring life, that brings truth, that that helps them to judge righteously in this time and in this season and give them the faith, the courage, and the boldness to say what needs to be said and give them the courage to not say what shouldn't be said in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that you said you make some to rise up and some to sit down. And I thank you, Lord, that you put people in the right place at the right time. And we declare it to be so in our own community in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I pray for every church in Central Louisiana. We pray for the church, but we pray for the, the, this community, the place that you've called us to be. I thank you that you, you give them strength and wisdom, a spirit of wisdom, a revelation, the knowledge of you. Come on, church, help me pray for these next few minutes. Give them a spirit of wisdom, a revelation, the knowledge of you. I pray for every shepherd, every pastor that's leading congregations. Give them wisdom right now now. Give them protection. Give them clear guidance and direction by your spirit according to your word. Angels, you watch over them and their family and their staff and their church family in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. And Lord, I pray for our CWC family that you strengthen us with mighty power by your spirit in our inward man. That you quicken our hearts by faith in Jesus' name. I declare that in this season that we'd be rooted and grounded in the love of God. And that we'd be fruitful and abound in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. That we'd be filled with love and patience and perseverance and faith. And I thank you, Lord, that with faith and patience, hallelujah, we will see the end of our faith. Hallelujah. And with joy, 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 joy right now. I'm, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke. I rebuke a spirit of infirmity, and I rebuke a spirit of depression in Jesus' name. Satan, you have no place. Plead the blood of Jesus over our church family, their mental state, their mental capacity right now, and over their health. Anyone struggling in their health, anyone whose immune system is down, or they have a bad report right now, I thank you, Lord, for the life of God that quickens their mortal bodies in the name of Jesus. By your Spirit, you're quickening in them. Lord, I thank you for those that are wondering about tomorrow as far as provision. I thank you that they stand on your word, honor you, whether it seems little or it seems big. They honor you, God, right now. And you provide for them the job that they need, the direction that they need, the clarity that they need, and a supernatural supply right now in this time. In Jesus' name. 